Hi everyone, Carl Steele here. English 3111 for Medieval English Literature, Fall 2022, talking about the Pistol of Sweet Susan, which is a Middle English alliterative poem from the 14th century. So this is a story from the Book of Daniel. It's possible though that you may not know it. So let me talk a little bit about its canonicity, the question of whether it, quote, belongs in the Bible. So the earliest versions of the story that we have are both Greek. They are based probably on lost Hebrew or Aramaic versions, but there are no surviving versions of this originally written in a Semitic language. And for that reason, some modern Christians, especially, and many modern Jews, don't believe that this story belongs to the Bible. When it is included in a Bible, it's either set as Daniel 13, chapter 13, that's in the Vulgate version of the Bible, the Latin version, or the Syriac version, or it's set at the very, very beginning as Daniel 1, and that's uh, it's quite rare nowadays. So as I said, Protestants don't consider this as part of the Bible, and neither have Jews since at least the Diaspora. So back in the Second Temple period, they did, but after that, no. Um, but the, still, the story is enormously popular for Roman Catholics and has been for at least 1,700 years. We have paintings of this in catacombs in ancient Rome, as I'll show you on the very last slide, where Susanna is used to symbolize the uh, Christ or the church, etc. And there are many, many medieval retellings of this story in many, many different languages. It's an enormously popular story, and it's also painted through to the present. There are versions of this by Picasso, etc. Um, this one, the Middle English one we're reading, exists in five manuscripts, none of which are the original. So every manuscript we have is a copy of an earlier version, which is now lost. And so that itself attests to this being a pretty widely read story. Again, many of the most popular Middle English works nowadays, Beowulf, Gowan and the Green Knight survive in only a single manuscript. So the fact that we have five of this indicates that it's probably pretty widely read. Two of the versions of this survive in enormous books, one of which is called the Vernon Manuscript, one of which is called the Simeon Manuscript. They are two feet long by a foot and a half. The Vernon Manuscript weighs nearly 50 pounds, so this is not a portable book. It's a book that if you wanted to move it, you would probably have your servants move it around for you because these are extremely expensive. And they're so big that you can fit the story of Susanna, this Middle English poem, basically on a single sheet. So this side, and then you flip the side, and it's written on the back, and that's it, and that's the whole thing. Um, so you can put a lot of information on this. So we have the Vernon manuscript on the left, the Simeon manuscript on the right, uh, the scribe. Uh, there's a shared scribe for both these books, and when they're copying uh, Susanna's story, they're copying from the same lost original. And so that's, that's unusual, the size of these books, and kind of fun to think about what that would be used for. So I'll talk to you a bit about the first stanza. I'm gonna read this to you in Middle English and I want you just to pay attention to the sounds of it. Um, so, cause this will help you understand what it is doing as poetry. And I'll translate it in a little bit. Um, there was in Babylon a barn in that borough reach that was a Jew gentle and Joachim he heeked. He was so lil in his law, there lived known him leech, of all riches that rank arrayed he was reeked. His inns and his orchards were with a deep dish, hollows and herbergages he upon heeked. To search through that cité, there nas non siege, of Erebus and every so avanonted leech he dicht that day within a circle of seas of Erber and alis, of all manner of trees, so to to say. So not perfect Middle English, but I hope it gives you an idea of what's happening here. If it seems rather complicated to you, well, so did people in the Middle English, Middle Ages probably thought it was complicated as well, because we have the Huntington Manuscript 114. This is now in Los Angeles, which has these red braces, which indicate the rhyming words. So this, this scribe has gone through and indicated which words are supposed to rhyme. So this is to help people read. So you see that day and say are connected and tree sees and alleys and trees are connected here. Um, we have Susanna, Su Susani actually up at the top. And then in a much, much later hand, this is probably from the 17th century, someone named Henry Spellman who maybe owned the manuscript at some point. So to talk about what kind of verse this is though, uh, well, 
the rhyme scheme, I think, should be obvious to you. And I've gone through and I've marked the rhyming words in different colors. So it's an A, B, A, B, A, B, A, B, and eight lines. And then we have C, D, 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 C in the last five lines. Uh, but the most important thing for understanding this is that this is a literative verse. This is an important kind of verse that we have in, uh, in Old English and in Middle English. It's generally not used nowadays, but we have many famous works that are written using this verse form, Beowulf, Sir Gowan and the Green Knight, and so on. And this is a version of that, which is called the 13 line stanza. And there are several different poems that survive in this. So the structure of this is we have the eight lines and then they're followed by the five lines, which are called a bob and a wheel. The bob is that two line thing, that day, and then the wheel is the next four lines. And the function of that in this particular poem is that the, the bob and the wheel tend to not add new information. They tend to just summarize the material that's happened in the first eight lines. So it's almost like they're kind of tying off the stanza or concluding it. Uh, so you will understand as you read through what is happening with the relationship between those last five lines and the first eight lines. So look for a summary, basically, in the last five lines. And let me just now concentrate on the alliterative meter of the first eight lines. So each line in medieval alliterative English verse comprises two halves. There's an A verse and a B verse. And I've gone through and I've indicated the distinction between those two verses with this horizontal line, which I've added in. And so we have the A verse on the left and the B verse on the right. And in each verse, the a, there's generally two stresses. There's always going to be two stresses in the A verse. And in the B verse, there's generally two stresses, but sometimes there's just one. I'll explain a little bit what I mean by stress. So when I say alliterative verse, though, the probably what you think of is alliteration, understandably, because it's called alliterative verse. But more recent studies in this verse, which have been really trying to understand how it actually works, have argued quite convincingly, I think, that alliteration, as we understand it, that is repeated initial stress sounds like deep ditch, for example, or halls and herbergages are just there to decorate. They're just decorative features. They're not the essential element of alliterative verse. The essential element of alliterative verse is the number of stressed sounds. And so I've gone through and underlined the number of stresses. So we have um, we have two stresses here in the A verse, two stresses, well, sorry, one stress in the B verse here, two stresses, one stress, two stress, one uh, two stresses, lived, leash, two stresses here, two stresses here, and so on. And if you read it out loud, it'll be easier to identify where those stresses are. The stresses are basically kind of important syllables. There is in Babylon, a burn, and that boro, reach, right? Babylon, burn, boro are probably the most important sounds in there. They're the ones that you're going to say with a little more emphasis. Those are the stresses. So in a literative verse, it's not by, you don't count up the number of syllables, per line. So like in Shakespeare's poetry, it tends to be 10 syllables a line. But in a literative verse, it's really about the arrangement of the A verse and the B verse and the number of stress sounds per verse that are arranged in this kind of pattern in relationship to one another, where oftentimes the poet will help you understand what those stresses are by repeating initial sounds two Ds in a row, H sounds, and so on. So you will see that generally speaking, we do have alliteration, that decorative feature in each line, but not in every single line. So um, this one, there's really, oh, this run here, ends in orchards, we're with a deep ditch. There's really not a consistent alliterative, alliterative sound in here, but it does, if you read it aloud correctly, you will still see there is a literature verse in terms of the number of stresses. So I hope that makes sense to you. Um, this is an, a kind of key feature of English poetry, and it's something that you will encounter if you read more and more medieval English poetry. So um, I've gone through and I've glossed all the words in here that I think will be unfamiliar to you. I've mostly used Russell Peck's stuff, and I've changed some of his readings. I think Avant, Avant, Nantlicha, 
probably instead of splendidly should be done as fittingly. I think Aranka could be done as man just as well as knight. I think burn is not boy or young man, but just straight up man and so on. When you're using a lot of alliteration, which you get in Middle English is a very specialized vocabulary because they tend to look for those words that will alliterate with each other. They have that decorative feature of initial repeating sound. So they'll they'll find you'll find words if you want to use Babylon, you're going to look for a word that means man that begins with a B um, because that increases that kind of decorative element. So you get oftentimes alliterative verse, a very unusual vocabulary, and you're going to find that here. So this will make it a little bit more difficult for you to read in several ways. Uh, two things I really want to call your attention to before I move on to the next slide. The uh, way that adverbs are formed in this particular dialogue typically is with a instead of an L-Y, like in modern English, is typically with a leecha, like, um, is how we would translate that word. So avant, avant, like, fittingly, is a way to translate that. Um, the leecha would be done as an L-Y. The word order is also often quite convoluted, and it's it does that in order to allow for the rhyme. So the rhymes sort of drive the syntax of the particular lines. So burn, reach, he's a rich man, but why is reach over here at the end of the line when it goes with this word? Because it means to rhyme. Um, there lived non him leech. There was no one who lived there who was like him. But again, you go non like him. But they're doing this because they want these words to rhyme. So that's sort of driving the syntax. That can make it a little bit hard to understand as well. So be aware of that. Now, here's my translation of this. There was in Babylon, in that rich city, a man who was a noble Jew. His name was Joachim. He was so loyal to his law that there was no one else like him. This man was outfitted correctly with all wealth. That is, he had everything that belonged to his status. Uh, he had halls and lodging places high upon a hill. And if you sought through that city, there was none other like it, so fittingly set up with garden plants. That day, within the whole world of plants and paths and all kinds of trees, truly to say. So you see, again, that the bob and the wheel basically just summarize the first eight lines. What are we being told here on the first eight lines? There's a very rich man. He's, um, he does everything correctly. He's Jewish. And he has a really beautiful garden. We don't know about Susanna yet. So this is what I want you to think about, maybe for tomorrow. We have a number of presentations. But the Vulgate narrative begins like this. Uh, now there was a man that dwelt in Babylon. His name was Joachim. And he took a wife whose name was Susanna. And then we hear about her family. We don't hear about Susanna really until a little bit later in the poem. So this one really starts the story by emphasizing her husband and his wealth and his beautiful garden. And indeed, one of the things that distinguishes this Middle English version version of the poem from other versions is the amount of attention it gives to the garden. The garden gets multiple, multiple stanzas in some of the most elaborate Middle English literary verse you're, you're likely to encounter. So I can ask that this question, which is basically what is the symbolic or conceptual relationship between Joachim's fancy garden and Susanna? And I'm hoping we get a chance to talk about that in class. Um, how does the poem handle the relationship between the garden's beauty, Susanna's beauty, and the threat of voyeurism? So, of course, the threat that Susanna is facing is these two old men, these wicked judges, powerful men, uh, are spying on her while she's alone in the garden. And then we, as the reader, are also, as it were, kind of staring into the garden and staring at Susanna. And it puts us in very awkward position, perhaps, of wanting Susanna to be innocent and rescued, while also perhaps participating in that voyeurism. How does the poem handle that? And then maybe you can, might even think about the fact that her savior is a boy, Daniel, who's 12 years old when he shows up and basically cross-examines the two judges and finds that they are lying uh, and rescues her. Why is he a boy in this version? So, uh, and putting together this presentation, I did a lot of research because there's a lot of stuff that was unfamiliar to me. This is my bibliography, but I want to call attention in this last slide as well to this very old 
uh, mural from a catacomb in Rome. This is uh, from the fourth century. So this is 1700 years old. This is labeled, in fact, it's very easy to read, almost to read the middle label, which here we have a lamb that's labeled Susanna, and then two wolves on either side of her who are labeled Senioris, old men. And we can talk about uh, why it's doing this, but it's clear here, the Susanna is a Christ image. So I'm looking forward to our conversation. Thank you for listening.